moment for me because one of my first introductions to history of science as an undergraduate uh, was reading uh, a, a book called Darwin, uh, which was uh, one of James Moore's books. Uh, and uh, so I was joking with him earlier saying that uh, his version of Darwin is my version of Darwin uh, because it uh, is the first book I ever read on the subject and that you know, those first impressions uh, stay with you. So thank you for, for that, for better or for worse. Maybe it's a wrong first title. Uh, but his, uh, his research concentrates on Charles Darwin, the life and legacy. Uh, he's also interested in science and religion issues, uh, evolutionary concepts uh, of nature and society, the popularization of science, and 20th century fundamentalism. One of his uh, recent books is Darwin's Sacred Cause, Race, Slavery, and the Quest for Human Origins. And I think we'll hear something about that today. So thanks very much, James. Let's get started. Uh, Twenty years ago, Adrian Desmond and I tackled an intriguing question. How did Charles Darwin, a respectable man with a dangerous theory, living in a hostile world, make evolution respectable? And our 800-page biography told the story of how he successfully managed his theory and its reception. But we were left with a nagging question. What led Darwin to theorize about evolution in the first place? Our biography only hinted at an answer. We hadn't answered that, and we agreed together we hadn't answered it. And that was our starting point in Darwin's sacred cause, tackling the leftover nagging question. And here today is our answer. This is why. The Portuguese slave ship Beloge, it's high noon on the equator, 23rd of May, 1829. The Beloge has been intercepted in mid-Atlantic by a British frigate. Below deck, 500 Africans of all ages and sexes are chained like beasts. The heat and stench is overwhelming. Three are dying every day, 50 since leaving West Africa and the corpses thrown into the sea. Aboard the frigate is a country parson trained as a medical doctor. He observes the captives and writes a report so harrowing, so heartbreaking, that it can hardly be read out in public. The Veloge must be released. She sails on to Bahia in Brazil, and the last parting sounds heard by the young priest are the cries and shrieks of tortured slaves. Seven years later, in 1836, Another son of the church with medical training had a similar agonizing experience near Pernambuco in Brazil, where HMS Beagle last touched the continent before dashing back to England. Charles Darwin reported hearing the most pitiable moans. I could not but suspect that some poor slave was being tortured, yet I was as powerless as a child even to remonstrate. To this day, he wrote years later, if I hear a distant scream, it recalls with painful vividness those feelings of anger and helplessness. Darwin's agony was only just ending. His awakening to the horrors of slavery had come at the start of the Beagle voyage. February 1832, three months out of England, All Saints Bay, Bahia, where the slave ship Veloge had landed its wretched cargo. The Beagle anchors here among vessels being fitted out with shackles, chains, and branding irons ready for return to Africa. Darwin sets off on foot to explore the capital, Salvador. Captain Fitzroy of the Beagle is carried in a sedan chair, you can sort of see him there, uh, by black slaves to the upper town. When he returns, he tells Charles, who, who, whose anti-slavery views he knew, that he had visited a plantation and the master, the slave owner, had called the slaves together, the, I should say the Af African captives together, and asked them whether they were happy to be African captives. And they said, sure thing. <laughs> and Fitzroy says to Darwin, and doesn't that prove that slavery isn't so bad after all? 
And Darwin, forgetting who he was speaking to, said, what value is a slave's word on such a subject in the presence of his master? And Fitzroy was really quite prickly. And he was only a few years older than Darwin. Darwin's only 22, so think how prickly a 26-year-old young man can be. <laughs> said, that's it, you know, you've questioned my word. It was a complete mistake. He was wondering whether the slave word could be trusted. But he, Fitzroy started questioning his own word. And he said, in that case, we can't dine together. Because Darwin was on board as a dining camp companion to the, the captain, he came with that close of being kicked off the ship and, to put it briefly, no origin of species. So that was important. And then he had his, Fitzroy had his comeuppance, or Darwin had his vindication, because a, a captain who was an old friend of Fitzroy's from another Royal Navy ship came on board, and they were having dinner. And this captain, in Fitzroy's presence, Darwin's writing home to his family, retailed facts about slavery so revolting that if I had read them in England, I should have placed them to the credulous zeal of well-meaning people. The extent to which the trade is carried on, the ferocity with which it is defended, the respectable exclamation mark, people who are concerned in it are far from being exaggerated at home. Darwin had been brought up on anti-slavery propaganda. Now he would face brutal realities of which he had only heard and read. He would never be the same again. Darwin was the first member of his family to live in a slave country, the first to put torn flesh on the famous medallion produced by his maternal grandfather, the pottery industrialist Josiah Wedgwood. Wedgwood first manufactured the medallion in 1787 at his own expense, and it was distributed widely and used like poppies or yellow ribbons are used today. A whole consignment went to Benjamin Franklin, I believe, in Philadelphia, or one of his friends. The medallion became a must-have fashion accessory for the rising middle classes. It was often copied and was small enough to fix on hat pins, snuff boxes, and even beer mugs. It's quite discreet, isn't it? The cause was abolition, the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade. The medallion had been commissioned by the Society for the Abolition of the Slave Trade as its official icon. Wedgwood, <clears throat> that is Darwin's grandfather, was a leading supporter of the society, and so too was Darwin's paternal grandfather. That's not his paternal grandfather on the left. <laughs> Erasmus Darwin was a true libertine. He believed as passionately in free love as in free Africans. He was also a Republican and backed the American and French revolutions. In 1789, he alerted Wedgwood to a political opportunity. And you can read what? Can you read that? Is it big enough? An instrument of art of torture of our own manufacture would have a great effect, I dare say, presenting it in the House of Commons. In politics, the Darwins and the Wedgwoods were liberal Whigs. In religion, Unitarians. They threw themselves into the abolitionist movement years before the more famous Tory Anglican evangelicals got involved, most notably William Wilberforce, and some of you have seen the amazing movie, Amazing Grace, which has only one credible character in it, I think. Chief among those conservative, so-called evangelical conservative saints, uh, Tory saints, was William Wilberforce, and his abolitionism had to be kick-started by the Darwins and Wedgwood's close ally and the only credible actor in Amazing Grace, Thomas Clarkson. Clarkson was an organizer, fundraiser, and an all-around anti-slavery activist. At Cambridge University, as an undergraduate, he wrote a prize-winning essay that in 1786 became the founding manifesto of the movement. Clarkson traveled 35,000 miles on horseback and stagecoach to report on the slave trade and solicit funds for the abolition society. He extracted large sums from the wealthy Wedgwoods, and he knew Charles Darwin's mother, aunts, and uncles years before Darwin, Charles Darwin was born in 1809. In the West, 
Midlands of England, Reverend Joseph Corbett served as Clarkson's personal banker and local agent. The Darwins were his neighbors. Corbett was a trustee of Darwin's boyhood school in the town of Shrewsbury. Corbett's son sat with Darwin's father as a county magistrate, Justice of the Peace. Reverend Corbett inherited property and became the squire of Longnor, a village just south of Shrewsbury. It was here that he and young Darwin became friends. At Longnor, Corbett's sister kept a diary. On the 12th of September, 1827, she recorded a party of young men visiting from Shrewsbury, probably to hunt and shoot on the estate. Two of them were about to resume their medical studies at Edinburgh University, Henry Johnson and Charles Darwin. Squire Corbett himself, that's Joseph up there, a friend of Darwin's, joined the group for dinner. Darwin's sister wrote to him back up at Edinburgh University expressing impatience that your friend Archdeacon Corbett has not called an anti-slavery meeting. He has always done so before and it is strange that he should not now. The reason why Corbett didn't call a meeting in Shrewsbury because the place was solid Tory slave supporting West Indian sugar manufacturing people. And if you can't get a rally off the ground that looks good you don't have a rally at all and that's why he didn't. Darwin's sisters were passionate abolitionists. The slave trade had been outlawed by Act of Parliament in 1807, two years before Darwin was born. Now in his teens, he and the whole Darwin Wedgwood family supported the campaign to abolish slavery itself across the British Empire. A national anti-slavery society was organized in 1823, and you can see it's its logo up there, it's, it's, a, in, it's a symbol. Darwin's aunt Sarah Wedgwood bankrolled the society out of the huge fortune, fortune she had inherited from the pottery, the Wedgwood pottery business. Her brother, Darwin's uncle Josiah II, that's his future father-in-law, owned the pottery and he stood for parliament on an anti-slavery platform and was elected a Whig MP in 1832 while Darwin was on the Beagle. Josiah's son Francis, Darwin's cousin, helped manage the pottery and kept the books for the local Hanley and Shelton Anti-Slavery Society which the family set up near the Wedgwood factory. Multiple copies of the latest literature were acquired for sale and distribution, including all issues of the anti-slavery monthly reporter, which exposed the sickening minutiae of colonial slavery. From its pages, Darwin probably first learnt of the horrors he would witness in South America. Now, a bit more of the science. While studying at Edinburgh University, Darwin was introduced to the physiology of marine invertebrates by Robert Edmund Grant, Britain's resident sponge expert. Grant had studied in Paris, Rome, and Florence. He was a free thinker, a Francophile, a Republican, and a follower of the great invertebrate specialist Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. Lamarck taught that life sprang up spontaneously from dead matter and progressed in complexity to produce every plant and animal species from mushrooms up to monkeys and human beings. But life for Lamarck had endless starts and progressions, each line moving upwards towards human beings, all the lines evolving in parallel. This meant that no race of, of mushrooms or of monkeys or of humans now living was necessarily related to any other such race. All the races, including the human races, had parallel linear pedigrees, no common ancestor. Evidently Darwin did not acquire his branching tree-like image of evolution from Dr. Robert Grant. One thing Darwin did learn at Edinburgh was how to stuff and preserve birds. In his first term there, freshman, he paid for 40 paid for 40 one-on-one -on -one lessons from John Edmonston, 
a free man or freed black slave from British Guyana who had adopted his old master's name, Edmundston. They were close neighbors in Lothian Street, and John gave Darwin lessons in the University Museum next door to Darwin's apartments. Decades later, Darwin would remember John as the full-blooded Negro, quote-unquote, with whom he had been intimate, a man with many little traits of character just like his own. Here was the most powerful proof of what Darwin had been taught since childhood, that black Africans and white Europeans had a common humanity. John was a man and a brother under the skin. He and Darwin were, as the Bible says, of one blood. After failing at medicine in 1828, Darwin went to Cambridge University to prepare to enter the Church of England as a priest. Cambridge was the spiritual home of Oh, sorry, but really annoying. Afterwards, perhaps somebody can tell me uh, how to get rid of this thing. Cambridge was the spiritual home of the anti-slavery movement. It was the University of Clarkson, Wilberforce, and other leaders. Reverend John Stevens Henslow had been caught up in the movement as a Cambridge undergraduate at the turn of the 19th century. He had felt a calling to Africa, and he supported anti-slavery organizations. Now he was the botany professor and Darwin's role model, the ideal parson naturalist, upright perhaps to a fault. They shared the same Whig politics. After Henslow exposed Tory election, electoral corruption in town, Graffiti appeared on the college walls, and traces of it could be seen until the 1960s on Pembroke, and then someone sandblasted that wall. Henslow, common informer. Darwin was known as the man who walks with Henslow. They became inseparable. By the time Darwin graduated in 1831, he declared, I do not know whether I love or respect him more. They planned an expedition together to Tenerife. And so begins a familiar story with a twist. The expedition collapsed. Darwin was offered passage round the world on the Beagle. Captain Robert Fitzroy was only 26 years old and Darwin 22 when they first met. Fitzroy had just returned, this is really important, try to retain this now. Fitzroy had just returned to England on the Beagle with four young people all under the age of 18, I think, from Tierra del Fuego, it's the southern tip of South America. These so-called savages were being civilized and Christianized, you know, taught English, table manners, read, things like that. And he, Fitzroy, had vowed to get them home to set up a church mission at the southern tip of South America, a strategic point in the world seas. And this would help make the Cape Horn region, obviously, safe for British shipping. To get the Fuegians back home, Fitzroy had stood for Parliament in 1831 for the borough of Ipswich, who's going to be an MP. And he stood as a Tory, anti-reform, anti-democratic candidate. Victory would have opened up political channels for him to return the Fuegians, pull strings with the Admiralty, to South America. But the Whigs swept power across the country, and 145 Whig votes stopped Fitzroy from becoming the Tory Member of Parliament for Ipswich. That is to say, 145 Whig voters enabled Darwin to take his place in history. Remember that next time you vote. Fitzroy refitted the Beagle at his own expense and set sail with Darwin as his dining companion, as I said before. Here's where they went. It's a bit of a strange map. Dates from the 1840s. Um, here is Rio de Janeiro. You'll know where that is. Um, up there is Salvador uh, in Bahia province. This is where Darwin first landed. Uh, we've been there before. Here's uh, Santos, the port for Sao Paulo today, and down there is Montevideo. After Darwin's row with Fitzroy at Salvador, the Beagle spent four months on this coast, 
20 months, in fact, if the coastline is extended down to the river plate. The waters here were infested with slave traffic from Africa. The red dots indicate only the well-known sites where slavers landed their cargoes and then refitted for return to Africa. The whole coast was porous with countless coves and tiny tributaries where slave vessels could hide. Bounties were paid. The, if the beagle had been quick enough to capture a slaver, everyone on board, including Darwin, would have been rewarded for the capture. Botafogo Bay, better known today for its football team, for those who follow soccer, where Darwin lived for two months in 1832. In the evening, he wrote, he would lie on the sand and watch the setting sun gild the bare sides of the sugar loaf, which you can see in the distance. While the Beagle was based here at Rio, Darwin had his most shocking encounters with slavery. On a plantation, <coughs> He witnessed the white owner produce a gun and threatened to drag all the African women and children to market and sell them away from their husbands and fathers. Against such facts, how weak are the arguments of those who maintain that slavery is a tolerable evil, Darwin exploded in a letter. And he was exploding at Fitzroy in that episode I described. Even at Botafogo, within Rio Harbor, slaves were being landed before Darwin's eyes. He wrote home again, protesting that someone ought to report the British official who winked at this crime. And he had in mind his formidable rich Aunt Sarah, who had sway in London. Opposite Darwin's house, he wrote, lived a lady who kept screws to crush the fingers of her female slaves, black African captives. So here we go. This is, I don't know how many of you have seen, maybe you're into this kind of kinkiness, but uh, it's, it's not a party. Um, this is diagram of what our friend Thomas Clarkson picked up in Liverpool. These things were openly on sale, you know, just like hardware. You'd make sure you had some on board in case somebody got unruly. So uh, the fingers, the female slave's fingers were placed under those hoops. And then, let's see, I think this animates. You insert the thumbs, and then you see what's happened. You, you put the key in, and you turn the key, and it raises the, 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 the plate, which is attached to the cylinder. And then you pull the key out, and your servant is left locked in agony with blood oozing from beneath her fingernails until she repented of whatever she did. In 1832, Fitzroy kept his word and returned the three surviving Fuegians to their home country. The Beagle left Jemmy Button and York Minster, as they were called, dressed as Englishmen on the left, your left. Two years later, Fitzroy returned to find that York had absconded and Jemmy had reverted to his native ways. The captain was dismayed by these so-called savages. He sketched York Minster, the eldest of the, the four originals, to show his misshapen nose and skull those of a troublemaker because Fitzroy believed in the science of physiognomy. He didn't like Darwin's nose either. And if you remember the portrait of Fitzroy earlier, I don't like his nose. <laughs> Darwin, for his part, liked these people and was more trusting. He lived with them on board for a year, and altogether he would spend two months in their native country, almost twice as long as he spent in the Galapagos archipelago. He had been astonished by the Fuegians' transformation into domesticated Englishmen. That's his term. Now he was shocked by Jemmy's rapid reversion to his wild state, Darwin's term. Darwin kept asking himself, whence did these people come? Here was a family of hunter-gatherers hunter living from hand to mouth in the forest and from the sea. They had no home. They slept like animals coiled up on the ground, and their speech was less intelligible to Darwin than animal sounds, he said. Why did they live here in this cold, wet, alien environment? Where had they come from? Darwin knew the Fuegians were fully human, brothers and sisters, 
descended from the hand of the same creator. He believed that. And he saw that they were adapted to their hostile environment. Jemmy's reversion to the wild proved that. For Darwin, this was evidence, more evidence, of the malleability of human nature. And what about the people of Patagonia? Whence had they come? On the plains north of Tierra del Fuego, Darwin lived among them for weeks. They were a distinct people, tall with booming voices, nomads adapted to their environment, like the Fuegians were to theirs. Fitzroy, who was pretty small, felt intimidated by these so-called giants and their booming voices. Darwin was intrigued. Were the Patagonians blood relatives of the Fuegians, despite their differences of habit and physique? Indeed, were the Patagonians and the Fuegians blood relatives of Englishmen? Of course, Darwin and Fitzroy believed so. All of them were descended from the same ancestral parents, Adam and Eve. But there was an alternative on board. And before I show that to you, I just want you to look at what the alternatives were at that time. You could believe with the president of Princeton, what became Princeton University, Stanhope Smith, that everyone here is descended from Adam and Eve, and Blumenbach in Germany, and Buffon in Carthage in France, and Pritchard, Charles Pritchard, a doctor in England, believed that. Autochthonous appearance means that they showed up where they were found by one means or another. We, they weren't necessarily descended, probably not, they just turned up, and all those various people believe that happened. Uh, something folk to believe that these, these these, these, these new races of people were generated by some process of nature we don't understand. Agassi believed that they were specially created on the spot, autochthonously. Polyphyletic, it means that there were numerous starts to the races, and they all sort of evolved up to other, or, or rather other things evolved into them. So instead of just appearing, this was a natural transmutation process, and we've already seen that Lamarck and Professor Grant in Edinburgh held that view. And finally, there's the view that all the races are commonly descended by transmutation, that is, by evolution, and not by descent from Adam and Eve. That is to say, they evolved from something else altogether, from a common ancestor. And that's where Charles and possibly his grandfather Erasmus, both passionately opposed to slavery and the unity, believing in the unity of the human races, come in. So what was it Darwin had on board? Oh, here, I'm just going to pick these up because we're going to come back to Pritchard, Agassiz, and Boris de Saint-Vincent, but we have to come to Boris Saint-Vincent first. The Dictionnaire Classique d'Histoire Naturelle had just been completed at Paris, and Darwin had his own copy on the Beagle, all 17 volumes, and I've gone through them myself. The article on man, which is marked by pencil, was accompanied by this map showing the primitive distribution of the genus man, the genus man, across the globe. It was the work of Jean-Baptiste Boris de Saint-Vincent, a Napoleonic military officer turned radical evolutionist, like Lamarck, like Darwin's Professor Grant at Edinburgh. So here we see how Boris marched the primates up through time in parallel lines to become 15 species of humans, each here assigned its own color with the legend on the left. Notice the southern tip of South America. The Patagon species, these are the ones with big booming voices and were tall, are called the Patagon species. And they occur here uniquely, according to Boris de Saint-Vincent, who's never been to South America, by the way. And these, this is the Melanian species. These are the Tierra de Fuegos. They are black. They are not black. But Boris thought so because he'd never been to South America. But he decided that these two peoples had, in, had, had, had originated separately as separate species in parallel lines. This had to be wrong. Darwin and Fitzroy lived with these people. But he had not. Patagonians and Fuegians belonged to one and the same human species. To believe so was part of an Englishman's Christian heritage. All humans are descended from the first pair, Adam and Eve. 
How then to explain the differences? By what means did Fuegians, Patagonians, and Englishmen all come from the hand of the same creator? Because there are real differences between what are called races. Darwin very likely first confronted the problem of human origins in South America. And in his Dictionnaire, Boris Dictionnaire, Darwin's copy, he had the latest scientific answer. Plural origins, or I call it pluralism. He rejected that answer and said so. Significantly, it was also, and this is the subject of another lecture, in Tierra del Fuego that, as Darwin later tells us, he devoted his life to the study of natural history. The lessons of South America were reinforced around the world. Everywhere Darwin found slavery, cruelty, and ethnic cleansing, and everywhere he saw a common humanity diversified into a racial rainbow. The Beagle arrived at the Cape of Good Hope in 1836, three years after the colonies enslaved Africans were liberated, together with all the slaves in the British Empire. The Sixth Kaffir War had just ended, and the colonial Boers had started their great trek north to establish a white homeland. Racial conflict was rife, and Darwin's copy of Bowie's Dictionnaire had two separate species involved, the Kaffir and the Hottentot, now correctly called Hosa and Kwekwe. What did Darwin do? He hired a young Hottentot groom as a guide and went on the road for a week. The boy at Kwekwe spoke excellent English, and he was, Darwin noted, a most tidily dressed boy. He wore a long coat and a beaver hat and white gloves. This is not he, but this is a rare representation of what a Hottentot groom would have been like. He was the perfect diminutive gentleman and quite as domesticated as Darwin himself. Here was further evidence of the pliancy of human nature in all its forms and colors. Months, perhaps just weeks after returning to England in 1836, Darwin committed himself to evolution. Listen to him arguing in a private notebook. The underlining is my emphasis. In this stream of consciousness, this is how Darwin made notes to himself, called it mental rioting. In this stream of consciousness, Darwin has seized on a unique image of evolution, evolution from one common ancestor. Not parallel linear descent as taught by Boris de Saint-Vincent, Lamarck, and Professor Grant, but branching common descent, the same family tree image that made all the races brothers and underpin the anti-slavery movement. Again and again, Darwin called it arrogance to deny life's common ancestry. It was the arrogance of the slave master who considers blacks to be other kind. The same was true for Darwin if you considered yourself superior to other animals because you alone were created by God with a rational soul. This too was arrogance, a moral indictment. Read him again. He's sneering. Here Darwin's reverend professors at Cambridge are his target. Men such as beloved Henslow, who hated slavery, but still believed in miracles and the uniqueness of the human soul. But a bigger target was moving into Darwin's telescopic sights. 
No one was more confident of his divine origin than the Swiss naturalist Louis Agassiz, Europe's foremost authority on fossil fishes. In the 1840s, Harvard University gave him a professorship, a chair funded by the local slave cotton textile industry in Massachusetts. And by 1860, Agassiz was the nation's leading popularizer of science. In America, Agassiz was sickened by his first sight of Africans. Uh, they were waiters at a hotel in Philadelphia. and He said that he wanted to be sick and leave the room when he saw their hands reach out to him and he saw the shaggy hair and the big lips. He couldn't believe they were related to him. He had thought the races were descended from Adam and Eve to inhabit, inhabit separate geographic zones. That was in Switzerland. Now at Harvard, he conceived, after the Philadelphia experience, that each race was created in its own zone as a separate type or species. This was pluralism, again, as I call it, but it was creationist pluralism, not transmutation. Agassiz launched it in 1850 at a meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in the slave port of Charleston, South Carolina. He commissioned a photographer to visit local plantations and make portraits of what were regarded as full-blooded Africans. <coughs> Seeing was believing for Agassiz. This is the earliest known image of a named African captive. Renti was not a man and a brother to Agassiz, but an unrelated human species. So here is God's plan of creation, according to Agassiz. He saw whole ensembles of animal species created progressively across their ranges in eight geographical zones. This is, I couldn't get them all on, so this is just four of them. And at the top you'll see the European, the American, the Negro, and the Hottentot. Each of these ensembles in turn was wiped out to be followed by a wholesale recreation until finally, in the course of time, spiritual man appeared on top. So eight different types of species of human were created, one in each geographical zone with its complement of co-created animal species. Every species, this is what's crucial, every species was appointed by God to live in its own zone. A species deteriorates if it's moved from its zone or if hybridized with a different species. Clever. God's plan, with a capital P, is thus to keep species separate, both geographically and reproductively, especially humans. In this tableau, there is no evolutionary blood relationship running either horizontally or vertically. These are all God's separate creations. So here is God's distribution of human species, according to Agassiz. The map is crude and beneath the dignity of a Harvard professor, who was undoubtedly a great naturalist. <clears throat> it was, in fact, propaganda drawn by Agassiz's popular henchmen in the South. But notice the clear division of species between what is arguably Patagonia and Tierra del Fuego. You know, Boyd Semesson didn't have a monopoly on this view of life. And notice the intersection of black Africans and white Europeans in today's Egypt, the red and the black. The Egyptian theme was fashionable at the time and developed by Agassiz's henchmen in the American Deep South, particularly Mobile, Alabama, Josiah Knott and George Glidden. Their book, Types of Mankind, was published in 1854 and it became the Bible of what they called proudly niggerology. Norton Glidden claimed that ancient Egyptian monuments demonstrate the permanence of black African servitude to a superior race. The African is static by nature because that is the nature of the African type or species. And here you could see Africans are shown as subordinate, being enrolled as slaves by an Egyptian master. What made this book most extraordinary was its introductory essay written by Louis Agassiz at Harvard. Darwin read the essay and was appalled. On one page when Agassiz had been going on like this, 
he scrawled, O pro pudor agassi, O for shame agassi. This was another moral indictment. The Bible of niggerology went further. It claimed that the basic types of dog kind were also permanent. All of today's breeds were derived from species that existed at the time of the pharaohs. Here you see the hound, the turnspit, and the wolf. The same was true of our livestock, poultry, and even pigeons. All the main breeds were separately, separate permanent or aboriginal species. So we can see that in the United States, farm animals and pets were being loaded with ideological baggage. The unity of the human species, or their plurality as separate species, the human races, was seen to depend on the unity or plurality of domestic breeds. And the debate grew fierce as the nation marched towards a great war over slavery in the 1850s. Darwin's informant about American prejudices was his old geological teacher, Charles Lyell. Lyle visited the United States several times in the 1840s and 50s, and each time he fraternized with Haggessy at Harvard. They were good friends, even though geologically they were not sing, singing off the same hymn page, if you see what I mean. He visited the United States several times, each time he Harvard. Lyle sympathized with the southern plantation owners and slave masters. He praised their benevolent paternalism for raising the status of black, backward blacks, and he despised the troublemakers, the abolitionists, who were trying to get rid of slavery, and he said so in print. Two two-volume books published in the late 1840s. Darwin was furious. It makes one's blood boil, he seethed, and he even published those words in the second edition of his journal of the Beagle Voyage, though without mentioning Lyle. Lyle's, here's the turning point, Lyle's pro-slavery sympathies and his intimacy with Agassiz, together with Agassiz's shameful essay in the Niggerology book, drove Darwin back to the greatest work ever published in defense of human unity, the five-volume Researches on the Physical History of Mankind by Dr. James Pritchard. Darwin bought the latest edition in 1856 as he began writing the big book that would become The Origin of Species. To Pritchard, the races were beautiful. These, these are original illustrations from my copy of the book, 1856. And he pictured them sympathetically. Far from Agassiz's fixed types, they showed a historical continuum of differences. Racial differences were produced over time. They were made, not created both by environmental effects and by mating choices according to local ideas of beauty. Adam was black, or so Pritchard believed, and all the races had diversified from a common stock within the four to five thousand years since Noah's flood. And that's the sticking point. His understanding of human unity is based on a short span of geological time and the traditional view of the Old Testament in the book of Genesis. So Pritchard was passé, but cutting edge in what came to be called anthropology was pluralist, separate origins, no common descent. And more and more people were turning to that, particularly on the continent, some in America, but not Darwin. For Pritchard, analogy was the key. What held true for farm animals and pets must hold for humans also. Pritchard knew that animals vary, they change little by little, slightly from generation to generation, constantly. Domesticated animals more than wild ones. Humans themselves had been domesticated, like their livestock and pets. Therefore, to show that varieties or races of dogs, as shown here, have been bred rather than separately created, proves that the human races too have been bred rather than separately created. All our races have descended, as Darwin said, from one common ancestor. The question was how? Darwin knew that humans are the only animal that domesticates and breeds other animals. So he decided to study them all poultry, rabbits, horses, pigs, dogs, more. But pigeons were his prize exhibit. They were small, they were portable, 
He had kids at home. They were adorable and they were edible. <laughs> so crucially, pigeons also had long been domesticated by peoples all over the world. In other words, pigeon breeding went on coextensive with the human races across the face of the earth. This is, it took us a long time to reach this conclusion. Listen closely. Darwin reasoned that the longer and more widely a species had been domesticated, the more its breeds revealed about the racial differences among the separate peoples who had kept and bred that species. That is, the racial differences among humans and among their animals had emerged together in tandem by selective mating. He kept up to 90 birds from home and abroad and he traced the fancy varieties in breeders' records and intercrossed them to discover a pigeon pedigree. Eleven races descended in four groups from Columba Livia, the common rock dove. So where did the fancy pigeon varieties come from? Pritchard had given him the clue. Mate picking made the difference, whether in pigeons or in people. Darwin now first called this mate picking sexual selection. Selective mating according to local ideas of beauty had produced fancy pigeons and fancy people. His pigeons were a miniature model of the human races. Fuegian, Patagonian, Quequé, Caucasian, all the races had been bred by humans themselves, not created separately by God. At the back of Pritchard's first volume, Darwin jotted how like my book all this will be. By that he meant the book that became the origin of species. Agassiz and pluralism had been answered with sexual selection. In 1857, at the last minute, Darwin dropped humans out of his big book, The Human Races. His main source of information in, in the Indian subcontinent had dried up, and the whole subject, he said, was too surrounded with prejudices to go ahead without a mountain of evidence. And then, as we know, in 1858, Wallace's essay arrived from the Far East. It looked like Darwin's own theory to Darwin, and he rushed to condense his big book under the title On the Origin of Species, where famously humans aren't in it but look closely. As he corrected proofs, he was corresponding about pigeons with a Jamaican ornithologist. Darwin now discovered that, like himself, his correspondent was a justice of the peace and a veteran abolitionist. Indeed, he was indistinguishable from a modern creationist in his understanding of natural history in the book of Genesis. Richard Hill was of mixed race, African on his mother's side, English on his father's. In his next letter, Darwin struck a rare personal note. I should say that Hill, after emancipation was completed in Jamaica, was employed as a magistrate to hear cases of agreed slaves, uh, who, uh, former slaves who had freed people who were aggrieved of their treatment by their owners. And as a mixed race magistrate, he made his name and eventually lost his job because the white governor removed him. Darwin himself was a radical abolitionist, and I make no apology for saying so. He declared that he would rather have the United States broken in two than see slavery protected in the southern states. <coughs> the destruction of slavery, he declared, I think rather glibly, would even be worth the loss of a million lives. We now know that Darwin was a disciple of the most extreme, nonviolent Christian abolitionist of his age. It was on Independence Day, as you probably know, Independence Day 1854 at Framlingham, Massachusetts, <coughs> that William Lloyd Garrison, a Yankee preacher from Boston, burnt the United <coughs> States Constitution in public to protest against Washington's continued support for the southern slave states. To Darwin, Garrison was a man to be forever revered, one he would always honor from the bottom of my soul. And Darwin doesn't use theological language like that lightly. <coughs> Darwin did not see his own science as politically inspired, but he did believe it was true 
and the truth shall set men free. And privately, his science took sides. And this became clear, and I'm winding up now, after 1865, when events finally galvanized him to publish on human origins. Sexual selection had flopped. Lyle's arrogance kept him from endorsing human evolution, sending Darwin into a tailspin. And the slaughter in America broke Darwin's heart. He was haunted, he said, by thoughts of suffering and of the humiliating slow progress of man, his words. In 1865, he fell into his worst ever period of depression, lasting for months. We would call it a nervous breakdown. As the war ended that April, President Lincoln was assassinated by a violent anti-abolitionist. And then came news in October 1865 of the Black Uprising in Jamaica. Colonial troops rushed in, 400 were executed, 600 flogged, 1,000 peasant homes were burned. The governor was dismissed, Governor Eyre, E-Y-R-E, and recalled to London, to England. He landed at Southampton in August 1866 to be honored with a banquet for his bravery. The Times newspaper listed a Darwin amongst the guests. And then in the very next issues, the next two days, the Times reported attacks on Darwin himself. He was being goaded, that's Darwin's word, to speak out on the origin of the races, to, de to renounce Adam and Eve beliefs and declare himself a pluralist with Agassiz and other rising world authorities. Weeks later, there was a confrontation. Darwin's eldest son, William, was the only Darwin living in Southampton. I know that because I've looked at all the directories and all the newspapers. But he denied his father's accusation that he had attended the banquet. That banquet of death, as it was called, that celebration of wanton cruelty and the taking of black lives. A committee was formed to prosecute the former Jamaican governor for murder with a £10,000 fund to pay for the prosecution. Old abolitionists subscribed in November 1866, one week after a final row with his eldest son, William. The Times listed Darwin amongst the donors to the £10,000 fund. It was the first time he had lent his name publicly to a political cause. And that was the turning point. That was at the end of November. Before Christmas 1866, he picked up the threads and began planning to publish on humans as a domesticated avenue, a animal with sexual selection explaining the origin of the races. Initially, Darwin saw a chapter on this subject in his big two-volume book, Variation of Animals and Plants Under Domestication. And that became an essay Typical Darwin, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger because there are more and more people to answer. He has to answer all of his critics beforehand. Then a small volume, and finally, by 1869, it was two volumes, two huge portly volumes called The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex, Sexual Selection. Two-thirds of this book were on sexual selection as the explanation of how human races came into existence. At the time of Darwin's death in 1882, moral progress was seen increasingly as the triumph of reason and scientific enlightenment, the emancipation of human minds from enslavement to priestcraft and superstition. Richard Dawkins. But the sun that lit Darwin's world was an imperial sun, which in his lifetime never set, though black chattel slavery had been outlawed in the British Empire. Much of the religion from which free thinkers saw Darwin emancipating humanity had inspired and driven his evolutionary project. The biblical precept, all nations of one blood, had been constitutive of his belief in the common ancestry of all life, even as this belief was stripped of Adam and Eve and placed on an empirical and theoretical footing. Darwin's moral judgment was consistent, as we have seen in his early notebook indictment of human arrogance, in his boiling anger at Lyle, 
in his shaming of Agassiz, and in The Origin of Species, where slave-making in ants is called an odious instinct. And finally, in The Descent of Man, where Thomas Clarkson is placed at the moral apex, and slavery is called a great sin. Eighteen months after returning on the Beagle, a year after he embraced evolution in his private notebooks and just months before arriving at the theory of natural selection, Darwin, not yet 30 years old, jotted to himself, man in his arrogance thinks himself a great work, worthy the interposition of a deity, more humble, and I believe true, to consider him created from animals. Here, ethics and epistemology and theology stand united. Values, science, and God are as one. Creation by evolution for Darwin is the true moral explanation of the history of life on Earth. And if that was so for Darwin, then we may be on the brink of a fresh reevaluation of Darwin's scientific achievement. Thank you.